Welcome to the Future of Resolution, Miles Mediation and Arbitration's podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Marcy Dixon. On today's episode, I am so excited that we have former Chief Justice Leah Sears and our very own Judge Susan Forsling. Justice Sears, I am. I have such a deep respect for your work, and I've followed your career um, and your many accomplishments. Thank you, thank you. And you've been doing a lot since you left the bench. You've um, written a book. Um, you are very active at your law firm. Tell us, what have you been up to? You know, after spending 17 years on the bench at the appellate level, I actually wanted to see what it would be like to jump in front of the bench and see, you know, uh, there were some things I saw lawyers doing that I wasn't a fan of, that I thought could be modified or changed a little bit up. And I wanted to practice appellate law. So I, I'm currently a partner at Smith Gambrell Russell in Atlanta. It's an old line law firm. And I do appellate work there. Uh, To be honest with you, one of the most exciting things I find myself doing is mentoring young associates there. I guess I'm sort of the old a woman of a certain age at this point. And it's nice seeing uh, other young people coming along, especially women. Uh, the practice of law, at least at big law firms, still has a ways to go for women and minorities. and it, The whole diversity thing, we haven't yet gotten right. So I'm glad to be sort of part of doing what I can for SGR uh, and the practice in general. And now that you've returned to private practice, um, what are the, some of the differences that you see now versus when you were a new attorney as you're mentoring the associates? What are you noticing? There is, when I was uh, started practicing, there was a real emphasis on, a much greater emphasis on courtesy, professionalism, uh, giving the other guy a break kind of thing. Uh, that's diminished somewhat, Uh And when I was practicing, I started practicing years ago in 1980 at a firm called Alston Miller and Gaines, which uh, morphed into Alston and Bird, where my daughter currently works, as a matter of fact. But uh, the business, it is, well, I just said it, it's the business of the practice of law now. And when I was just starting out in 1980, it was a profession of the practice of law. Of course, everyone wanted to make money at it, but this is a sort of business on law on steroids. Let's put it like that. And it's sometimes not very palatable. I'm enjoying listening to Justice Sears. No, but jump I in. Mean, I mean, I mean, we I'm went through awe. much of the same. We did. I mean, what, um, what year did you? Same year as you. I you graduated started... 1980. I started okay. practicing in 1980, and I agree 100% with your uh, assessment. I would also add that it was a more personal practice than it is now. We right. were very detached through... You know, the electronic age, Um, I remember that um, you would pick up the phone and have a conversation. It wasn't an email or a text. Um, If I mailed Justice Sears a letter, I wouldn't expect her to to have received it the minute I I mailed it. (laughs) And in fact, it was a big deal when we went from courier to fax. And so there was a, it was also a different pace. We were all mindful of billable hours. That wasn't because we were in it to make money as well as to have a personal enjoyment. Um, But it's a very different time. But I think what has not changed, I think the work balance struggle, particularly for women, has remained the same. And it has, in my mind, not necessarily gotten any easier in terms of uh, achieving that uh, work-family balance. But now, when I was at Alston, Miller, and Gaines, which morphed to Alston Mm -hmm. and Bird, there were four women and then the whole law firm. Of course, the law firm was 100 lawyers. It's Mm -hmm. 900 now. Mm -hmm. But... Oh, uh, but now, I mean, 40 percent, uh, at least of the associates, counsel and all that. Very few equity partners. I right. think there are two. Of I think us. that's right. OK, right. two, two or three or maybe five equity partners. But a lot of a lot more women lawyers, they're just not making it through the pipeline and going up to the very top. And the women that do make equity partner aren't at the very top of the income chain. Well, and I think you also don't see very many women as first chair in the courtroom. You know, my experience is a trial uh, court judge. And as much as the percentages have increased, 
um, you just don't see right. that, that sort of first chair. Right. You know, I remember I was the only, I was the first female hired to be a lawyer for Fulton County. They'd never heard of such, and it was basically a part of their idea of a diversity program. Right. Um, and I remember when I was pregnant with my first child, and I went to the county manager, and it was like, well, you don't get maternity leave. <laughs> Is that right? And there was no maternity leave. There was leave. no maternity leave. And I simply said, but what about Mr. So-and-so who just had a heart attack <laughs> and he hasn't been back to work in six weeks? <laughs> you know, do I have to have a heart attack to get six weeks off? Did they give you? Yeah, they ultimately. Okay. I'm just suggesting we've no. made some great progress. Um, we have much more progress to go. I mean, because even in our firm, we have paternity leave. Sure. Too, but and... that's all changing. I mean, we didn't yeah, have, I'm saying right. that's. Oh, definitely. These are part of the evolution of having the more women in the practice. But I do think having those numbers, I still think there is a huge struggle for women in terms of the work-family balance. I, I, I think yeah. more so for women than for men. And I, I don't agree. think we've gotten our arms around that right? Um, as a profession. Right. The other thing, if we're just talking about women, is the unconscious bias that I still think we struggle with uh, uh being less than, mm -hmm. and particularly if you're a, a minority mm -hmm. and a woman, but mm -hmm. being less than. And then, of course, I think we choke ourselves off some, what, by not being risk takers. And, you know, so, point. See, some of our, the behaviors that we have aren't suitable for moving up the chain. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have access to mentors and sponsors. Uh, there's a lot of lip service to that, but uh, it's just, so much of it is just lip service. So, I mean, we, we, we've got a, a, a number of, of things that ha have to be corrected to see the balances be where they really should be. Right. And that's why I think it's wonderful that you've circled back. Yeah. You started in the practice. You had an incredible career as a trial court judge, an appellate judge, which is probably what you're most known for. I remember when you were on the, the uh, trial court bench, right. and now you're circling back. So you the... really think that was good? I'm glad to hear that, because I really enjoying that. But that's so odd. You know, most people don't. Well, you circle back. I mean, you've circled back. I mean, you've got, got off the bench. Most people you know, because we've got to be about the same age, right? Yeah, I don't know. I'm 62. <laughs> I'm 62. Are you 62? <laughs> I'm 62. Okay, but so we're you, the same. But, but, but you most have, people just stay on and right. on and on till 75. But you have circled back to the practice. Oh, I see. And what I'm suggesting is what you have learned from your perspective of being a practicing attorney at a very high level, being in a trial court, and being on the highest court in our state, to circle back with that experience into the practice, I believe you can be an agent for change. Yeah. Well, I really do. Well, thank you. That's I mean what that. I'm trying to do. Well, Because think, that, that mm -hmm. actually is my mission, my whole underlying mission in life is to, th this thing, I was born in 55, as I presume you might I was been. born in 55. <laughs> what, month, what month were you born? June. All right, I'm August. So okay, we're so you're, Okay, so uh, uh, things had to change. I mean, mm -hmm. they really had to change for us yes. to be able to get what we really wanted. That's life, exactly so. right. I, um, Justice Sears, I recently heard you speak at Savannah Law School. Oh, you I, were there? Mm-hmm. Oh, my no, God. I was right there in the front row. <laughs> okay. Just completely engrossed. Yeah, you really get around. I do. Okay. I was sitting right next to Sally Aiken. Okay, okay. Who's on our panel okay. uh, down in Savannah. But I was very moved to hear about your experience of being appointed by Zell Miller. Um, and can you just talk um, about that experience of being appointed to the Supreme Court and um, how you were received and just that entire period of your right. career? Well, yeah, Zell Miller uh, was new as a governor. Uh, it was pretty obvious he had made a campaign promise, uh, not just the lottery, but he had made a campaign promise to, to, to put a woman on the court. There, was no, there were no women on the court. There was Bob Benham, he's a black guy, but no women of any color on the court. I was only 36 years old, and uh, but I applied. You know, everyone said, oh, you're nuts, you're nuts. And I halfway thought, well, remember Conley Ingram, I called him up because he had been at Alston and, and Bird, and I, he said, go ahead and apply because uh, 
you've got to get your name circulated. So by the time you hit like 44, you'll be part of the mix and they'll be thinking about you. So I filled out my application, turned it in. I was the last, uh, was obvious of the, the, the I went to, to the judicial JQ, JNC, right. interviewed, got on the list of 10. The list of 10 had eight women and two men. It was pretty obvious it was the governor was being set up to appoint a woman. I went in uh, not thinking I had a shot at all because I'm 36, I'm black, and uh, he had a black. And, you know, I, I'm thinking it's always token, so he's going to, he's not going to get me. And he'll get an older, one of the older women there had been around longer and we just, he sat on the couch and I remember was talking and I was just blah, 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 you know, the way I tend to do. Uh, and I was getting up to leave and I said, I bet you think I'm too young. And he didn't say anything. And I, then I gave him this long litany about, I'm not too young. The, the, the court is old and dusty white guys. It's time to mix it up except for Bob Benham, who I love. Uh, Jefferson was, uh, Martin Luther King was 38 when he was assassinated. Was a, you know, uh, March on Washington, he was 34. Or I just went through, uh, Thomas Jefferson was, how old was he? You went to UVA. When that, how old he, he was in his early 30s or late 20s when he, when he, did the Declaration of Independence. We're sending men, at the time it was men, off to war at 18. About, no, I'm not too young to do it. And he was, I think, very impressed with that. As I was about to leave, he said, no, come here, look, look. This may not be your time, but uh, you need to keep trying this. I said, okay, thank you very much. And I left, and he called uh, about a week later, and... I didn't know what he was calling for. <laughs> I didn't. I just, there was a court of appeals vacancy at the same time. And he had called the office two times before I got there. I was at a place called Lombardi's yes. having a oh. Valentine's Day uh, lunch with my then husband. I smelled of garlic, focaccia bread. I w right. Yeah, it was a great focaccia bread. I went back over there. My secretary when I walked in the door, Fulton County Superior Court said, the governor's called you twice. Get in there. And I was like, the governor, really? He calls again. And I just remember, I'm going to appoint you very slow to the Supreme Court. And I said, what? <laughs> and a crowd had gathered in, my, you know, how the chambers were in there. And they all thought I'd gotten the appointment to the Court of Appeals. And then I looked up. I was like stunned. And I looked up and I said to my secretary, Betty, he, he, it's, a, it's the Supreme Court. And she went, ah! And then she started yelling, y'all, it's the Supreme Court, y'all. And, uh, you know, the rest is pretty much history. Yeah. And what's interesting and fascinating, too, is do most people know that you were on the short list of replacements for the actual U.S. Supreme Court? I think so. You do? Yeah. Okay. It's it's hush hush. But it's not hush hush. They the oh the Obama administration, I think, actually puts it out, plants it where he wants it to be planted to get feed they all do that, to get feedback. It was the I went through the process. It was the most intensive, intrusive process which I guess it must be. I mean, my kids were Facebooked by the White House. I was like, tell your children that a uh, woman named Jackie will befriend them and accept them as a friend. And then they could look at their photographs and, and they looked at my health records. I remember being asked why I had had a blood pressure spike three years earlier at a, when I went to a, uh, physical. And I, I don't know. I don't, I was stressed. I don't know. I mean, they are really, they look under, under every, and I, for Obama, I wanted them to, because I didn't want to embarrass the guy who was trying to, had, was considering. You know, Justice Sears, when we started practicing, and now we've established that was virtually the In same the, month, if right, not the right. same year, uh, 
ADR, either arbitration or mediation, was just not acceptable. Right. People were not doing right. it. Judges hadn't bought into it as an, a valuable part of the litigation process. But what I'm seeing now, and I'd like to hear your comments on this, it is part of the pre-trial pre process. In other words, at some point, either before or after dispositive type motions or while they are pending, at certain key points before uh, large amounts of money are gonna have to be spent, for an example, on expert witnesses, the cases are being mediated. Absolutely. Either because a judge says, I'm not even gonna put you on the trial calendar until you mediate, or because there's been enough done where the parties begin to recognize there may be some value to mediation. I think that's right. And and I'm wondering what your thoughts are. I mean, I think it being so accepted, it's as, is, is as routine as entering a pretrial order of the parties at this point. And do you see that trend continuing into the future? And if so, why? Well, it uh, settles cases. I mean, it settles. It works. A, it does work. <laughs> I mean, it, it settles a lot of cases, particularly if you get, I call it the sweet spot, when you can, it's the right time, the right place, and let's just do this thing now. I mean, those, it, when, when you're mediating in the sweet spot, it's as good as a jury. I mean, you know where it should land and all that. So, uh, yeah, I think it's going to continue. I know it's going to continue, and I, I hadn't thought of it like that. Uh, Judge, it is part of, it, it. when I was, I mean, I remember Harold Clark, who sort of right. coming down to, I was uh, sending a few people out just to begin to negotiate, and he sent Ansley Barton down to watch it in my courtroom, and there was no mediation, no arbitration, no Georgia uh, uh, commission on, none of that, and, uh, you know, it's, this is all part of the litigation process now. It's like these, uh, 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 what do you call them? The courts, uh, business courts, the uh, accountability courts, the accountability a specialized court. yeah, type. It was court. very weird at first. Yes, it was know, uncomfortable. It, it was awkward. Exactly. We didn't know how it fit into right, the exactly. mainstream. And then and it, think, it just starts to fit in. Well, I, I, my experience has been I've been mediating full time now, five headed into to year six is that so many of the, the litigants, the private parties, not so much the corporate entities, simply want to be heard. And my view is they can have their quote unquote day in court in a mediation that's properly handled. Right. And that allows people having been properly heard, properly responded to in a very respectful, courteous, collaborative way, frees them up to make a decision that they know is best. Right. And in some measure, I believe that's a way to bring some of the profession back to litigation that you and I are lamenting has been lost in the last 30 or 40 years. I hope so. Well, that's our goal. I, I, yeah, that's I our hope goal. so. I like, I like the, the new core value, the core values that you have. That's a, that would be a good one, you know, to uh, enhance professionalism mm -hmm. and all that, you know, diversity is good too, and there are other very good values, but to enhance professionalism, we, we could do, I mean, I do think mediation and arbitration too does enhance professionalism. Uh, uh, if it could, if it could uh, lead on to litigation, I'd be very happy. Well, and I think so. I think that the number one thing is it's, it's, it's a time of collaboration in mediation. Right. Everybody that walks in is for one day has the same goal and on the same page. And adversarial natures do not produce compromise right. results. And if you can kind of put that hat off for a day and begin to take on the persona of, you're not my enemy, we both really want to get this done today, let's roll up our sleeves and let's try to find a way. It carries over necessarily in the process. Yeah, and that's what we hope to do not impose decisions, but allow people and empower people to make decisions, but only after they've been fully heard. Yes. If mediation brings parties together in a collaborative fashion, there's nothing adversarial because the decision makers are the parties, not the neutral. Right. And in order to get a case settled, everybody's got to agree. And so there's no room for uh, chest pounding, name calling, or any of even the subtle form of the adversarial nature, none of that. 
that I believe it's the kind of thing, at least for a day, if we can get along and, and work toward something, then we know that there's a benefit to that approach, that it's not a comp it's a compromise of the case, but it's not a compromise of being zealous advocates Zealously. for our clients. Right. And it promotes professionalism in that way. In other words, you and I can agree to disagree, but we can come together right. and we're going to set a fair value for each of our clients. To me, that is really essential in promoting professionalism. Yeah. What we need to make sure, and you guys might want to work on this, is that there are some lawyers that do not approach mediation with the goal of let's resolving this case. You're right. Okay, and when you have a lawyer like that, it's it's not collaborative. It's just, right. you know, and I don't know how you weed people out like like, I don't know what you can do with, do you have a, I mean, well, you've been at this. I think a skilled mediator will identify okay. that fairly early on. Okay. But what a skilled mediator will do is urge that person to at least be respectful and listen. The okay. primary example, you'll come in and the plaintiff, for an example, might want to present 30 minutes of a PowerPoint, right. life of the person involved, okay. And the person who doesn't want to get their case settled says, I don't have time for this, I know the case, Right. tells the mediator, we're not going to do this. Right. So the mediator has the ability to say, we're here. We're going to be here for a few hours. Let's offer them the affirmation and respect. That's you don't right. have to agree. Right. We're, we're going to be here for a while anyway. Why don't you just listen? Right. And so you understand that they're reluctant, but at the other hand, you don't let them wiggle out from right. under it. Right. And then once you, they get into that conversational mode, you would be surprised how often but, they realize there's benefit to this and we might just get this done. Okay. That's, and then the that's second excellent. Thing, and I think the second thing that comes out of it is they get the benefit of an evaluation from a neutral party. Right. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. Oh. I mean, there's always value that's right. in knowing what your case might be might really look Wait, like realistic. Right. Where are right. your risks? Right. Where does a neutral with a lot of experience see your risk? Right. What are the issues you're going to have to overcome going forward? Um, so a good neutral will keep them in the room, urge them to listen, and talk with them about something they do value, right. which is an opinion about where they're headed, where their risks are, where the other side's risks are. And sometimes those cases just settle, despite themselves and right. the lawyers. Right, <laughs> yeah. right. That's, that's good. Yeah. That's it's good. a great process. Yeah. Justice Sears, your biography, right. Seizing Serendipity, published last year. What's the takeaway for readers? It's written by Professor Rebecca Davis. She's actually a lawyer, too. She went to, graduated from the University of Georgia, but she teaches political science. I think it's political science at Georgia Southern College. She started... Uh, following me like 10 years before I retired from the bench. Just, I'd be in Washington giving a speech and she'd jump out and, and she met my brother and went to the Supreme Court. Sounds like Marcy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, where is Waldo going? Yeah. You know, she would like, went just to talk to Clarence Thomas at the Supreme Court, flew to all over just to, you know, uh, so it is her book, not mine. It is about me. And so when I got the book, I stayed up all night, tri you know, trembling, hoping that it, that nothing in there would really devastate my mother. It was fine, you know, was a good book. But uh, I'm so I'm not really looking to get anything out of it. it <laughs> I'm definitely not getting any financial anything. But it is, you know, it is, look, look, let's be honest. It, it's flattering that someone could write a biography and UGA Press would publish a biography. I think their goal, uh, UGA's goal, was to highlight sort of another generation of what they deemed, uh, this is what I think, civil rights leaders, mm -hmm. uh, the non-Andy Young. What happened after Andy Young put me on the bench? What did I do to move the ball further down the field? There is a, a movement of, about afoot now. We, we're called the integration uh, guinea pigs. Kids like us who integrated schools, because I never went to a segregated school, for example, integrated schools, and what happened? You know, what happened next? It's sort of history in the the next wave. The uh, 
Becky Davis, the author, believes the reason uh, Georgia wanted to publish this book is because I was on the forefront at the uh, at the Supreme Court of LGBT rights, and it was when I joined the court, it was a no no, but by the time uh, the book was published, it was just one of those things, and. Uh, the the uh, she believes UGA Press was really interesting, interested in looking at the. I went through a lot of hell through mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. period. The governor brought Roy Moore over from Alabama, said I had no family values. Now I know that was a good thing, but at the time <laughs> it hurt my campaign. Uh, it was just very very painful going mm-hmm. through all of that. Uh, and now nobody thinks anything of it. You know, people don't really understand sometimes the sacrifices that have to be made so that everyone could just, like, it be no, no big deal. Like, like my daughter, who is 31, doesn't really understand the sacrifices women went through. For her, it's like, what, no big deal. The woman flew the plane and, you know, no one got killed. It's just... It's been mm-hmm. amazing watching the all the change that that's happened mm-hmm. uh, since I was born. So, what would you want a young woman to take away from that book? That you could do anything, and a young man. I mean, you can do anything if you just persevere. Uh, uh, I asked Becky why she called it uh, seizing. Sir, I didn't get to name it. Like, why? What is this seizing serendipity thing? What is this? And she believes that in all my life stories, what I did was see opportunities no one else could see, like even applying at 36 to the Supreme Court uh, instead of waiting Mm -hmm. to be called up. She believes I saw opportunities that no one else could see and seized them and then moved up. And she believes that you should seize her and seize it and sees it, and sees it, and that'll, that, that's her take. I didn't get to pick the title. I was surprised she, uh, you know, that was her. I mean, you know, she even has a section in there about African-American hair, because I, mm-hmm. I would lament to her, oh, God, I would have to go to camp. I always went to camp with all white girls. They jump in the pool. Shoot, I can't, I can't jump in the pool. <laughs> I mean, I these this is before. Can't. Yeah, no, no, I can't. But at the time, I was a little girl. I don't have wash and wear hair. Mm-hmm. It's very, very curly. Crap! If I jump in, I'm gonna. There were no blow blow dryers, nothing. So I go there with a perm, and uh, even now, uh, I went natural, kind of like. You can't see my fist raising people on the podcast, <laughs> but I went natural, and I make a really big thing about natural hair. Mm-hmm. So the things that affected me uh, be stuck with me the rest of my life, and I'm, you know, I just they never left. Now that you've left the bench, are there any cases that you wish you could have heard since you've left? Cases that that you no, were wish you were I, there to kind of weigh in on. No, and, no, no. You're happy to leave that to I your was, colleagues. Yeah, it, yeah. yeah it, w- it was just time to go. I mean, I was happy to uh, weigh in on the cases I had the opportunity to weigh in on, but I have not regretted a day. Uh, maybe the first day when I had to. I had to learn to text. <laughs> and I like, what is this? You know, and I'm like in the all we all had the judges had flip phones and you know, you didn't email and you just didn't do all that kind of stuff. But after I got used to it, uh, you know, I just really, really liked the the pace is very fast. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I have a lot of energy and and uh, I had to kind of shut down some of that to be able to be on the court. So this this uses, I mean, like I can be here. You know, I could have done this as a judge, but I would be very watching, you know. You'd have to be the, constrained. All the time wondering yes. what case I, should I, shouldn't I, should I, shouldn't I. I think it's really encouraging to people to understand that there are um, necessary endings. I read this book by Henry Cloud and it's called Necessary Endings and it's really stuck with me. I read it the year before I decided to step down from the bench. 
And it talks about there are certain endings that are necessary for your personal development. And instead of, a, and for others, the right. personal development of others. Because when you left, someone else got to be on right. that court. When I left, someone else got to be on that court. My only point is I think that we well, need what, to. What was he saying? That they are necessary? They're necessary. And you've got to embrace the good that comes in change. Okay. And there's a number of good that comes in change. That we are, you know, life is not stagnant. Right. And, and, and we need to embrace right. that and understand when there's an ending, there's an opening. And when there's an ending for us, it's an opening for someone else. Oh, I love that. It's a, it's an, it's an, he's a life that. coach. He's, he's uh, as well and does a lot of core right. work. My, my only point is what right. we were talking about is how it was a little bit scary. It was certainly humbling and it required a kind of a lot of work, but neither one of us looked in the rearview mirror. Right. We yeah. just kept going forward. And if I would encourage anyone, if, if you're thinking about doing something new and different, do it, do it while, while you, you can. can. Yeah. Um, it's later than you think. Yeah. And you don't want to be, to use your words, Justice Sears, not relevant. Yeah. You don't want to just right. be that person who stays for the sake of, uh, of saying right. because there's just so much there's uh, so much out there and I would say with you you have really come full circle going back to oh, the practice having reached you know the highest highest office in in our state and people admire you people follow you people have thank done you. things that they ordinarily wouldn't have done because you did it that is really exciting oh, thank you thank you so much and for me um i just love being with people because when you're on the bench it's a very constrained conversation it's detached it's in the format of legalese and you are a people person i am a people person yeah. and i love and i hope i'm an effective communicator and what is so nice to take this practice of law and apply it in a way that people, the average person, can understand the practice, understand the dynamics, understand the law, and try to make some important and intelligent decisions about resolution versus litigation. And so I feel like it's a full circle right. for me, you having too. started as an advocate and now coming back to one that says, let's talk about other other options. What is the one book you want to write? I don't think I want to write a book. I want to write pieces. Mm -hmm. okay? What's the one piece you want to write? What's compelling right now? I don't have a... Honestly, yeah. I, I'd just be saying something. Okay. I don't really, I I'm, I'm, I'm have to make a presentation, an, a one-hour presentation to a client out at Lake Oconee. They hired me to come and sort of keynote, and I can't figure out what to say to them. And so I'm in this, hmm, stage, you know, what do you say to a group of businessmen? What does a somebody who's really a judge and who probably always will be sort of a judge type person. What do you say to business people? And I'm, I, I, it will probably be in the civility, the integrity, the, that, that, that big to me, but I, I can't focus it down. If you have an idea. Why don't you suggest that, to them that they see opportunities that other people don't see and they seize them. That's right. your story. See serendipity. I wouldn't use that word. No, but but, but I, that's not my word. But what I heard you say is essentially the the takeaway from wow. someone writing about your life Whoa. is that you saw opportunities that aren't there and you seize them. And there's no more effective business model when you think about the wow. business giants. Think about Amazon. I mean, saw an opportunity nobody else saw that we would now have e com. I mean, commerce would be done the way it's done. It's changed commerce. What about um, Zuckerberg? He saw a way that we're going to communicate oh, that we never you saw. you just hit it. That I is what I needed to come up here. That's beautiful. I will it, do that. Well, it's you. I will do that. Uh, that's, that's perfect because that is about growth, and that's, that's what we should And you be, can pull everything you know, that's into. That's really beautiful. That's it. That's why you came. Okay, that's why I came. <laughs> and I guess this is what you guys are doing. And that's what ADR, that's where ADR uh, has flourished. There was a gap, I mean, a big, big gap. And you guys came in and you're filling that gap. Just don't stop right. filling the gap. Because when you see little uh, chinks, things that need to be corrected and all that, Keep expanding, keep growing, keep changing, uh, but keep staying relevant. Okay, keep keep modifying yourselves 
because you guys can only get it. So rebranding yourself at this point was probably a very good thing to do. Going back to core values, one of our values is diversity. And I know that you talk about that extensively. I mean, that's been a problem for ADR mm -hmm. in this. Mm -hmm. This I have mm -hmm. been uh, uh, recruited, recruited, rec I just didn't want to do it as a full-time job yet. I don't, I don't know if I would ever do it full-time. You're the perfect mediator, Susan. Could you say that again, you Justice are the Sears? Mediator. <laughs> you know, you have to have the right. But I'm good. But uh, uh, sometimes I, I can't listen to some of the stuff you have to listen to. You have to have patience, <laughs> just like you did as patience, a trial court like, judge. I know, I know. But I, but I think, <laughs> um, Justice Sears, Marcy's raised a really good fr um, point. Um, diversity, like we faced when we were starting and we're still facing in many areas right. of the law, certainly ADR has been very slow to respond to it. And one of the things that um, our founder, John Miles, has said, it's going to start here and it's going to start with us. That's good. That and will expand your business well, so much. It, and it's the right thing it's, to it's, do. Right. It's the right thing to do and it's the right way to serve clients. We right. have a very diverse clientele. And so one of the things we really are um, happy about here is that we embrace it, we enjoy it, and we, we have diversity at the very highest level. Do but we, we have That's a good. lot of work to be done in this industry. We do. We do. You, know, you could look at, at the, when the daily report runs, I'm like, oh, my God. And, you know, and the one or two blacks that might be there, you know, they're really not mm -hmm. practicing actively. So. And that's uh, what's interesting because we don't want poster children. Right. And so the, the folks that we have. Um, you want them to be working. And they are. Right. right. And that's what's really great about this place so that when people of all cultures and backgrounds come, they see people of all cultures and backgrounds here. Right. And but we'll what working I, on well, we do. Excellent. We're just beginning, but this ADR industry, it needs to respond. It's a it's behind much like what you faced when you started with the law firm right. and I faced when I began practicing law. And it's come a long way. And so what we want to be is thought leaders by example. Excellent. In that area. That's good. Justice Sears, thank you so much for joining us. It was wonderful discussing your incredible career your perspective, and your hopes for the future. Talking with you about going back in the day a little yeah, bit yeah. and where we're going in the future and just really hearing from you. I've admired you um, throughout and, your and entire career and all of the incredible benchmarks. Um, but I've really admired you because you're just a neat gal. Oh, thank you. And so you're real. You. Thank you. And you're smart. Thank and you. And you're articulate. Oh. And all of those things um, make you who you are and why people admire you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you I mean you it from so my heart. Much. Thank you. You've been listening to The Future of Resolution, the podcast. You can follow The Future of Resolution on Miles Mediation and Arbitration's Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. If you haven't yet, go to Apple Podcasts or Spotify and subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. Join us soon for another interesting discussion. Thank you for listening.